chapter 20. Last week we looked at the first eight verses. We considered our hang-ups. We decided that uh, hope, hopefully we all found out that we have, we, we all have a few. The good news though is that all of our hang-ups, all of our collective hang-ups as humanity doesn't stop God. The good news is that God goes on. Our hang-ups don't hang him up. Even when we hung him on the cross, we find that it actually furthered his course. The things that we think are tragic and disastrous, and they may be disastrous, they may be tragic. And yet God is God. He's great, and, and the greatest thing about his greatness is he's good. And he works all things together for good. To those who love him and are willing to cooperate with him in his purpose. And so his purpose is always good, and yes, we have our hang-ups, but you know what? Life lives on, love wins out. Good news, every week. You know, if, if you want to read the news, the rest of the news, all week long, and get stressed out, and, uh, and then talk about nothing else all week long, you join, join the crazy crowd. I mean, it's, it's what we tend to do, but at least for a little bit, for a little while here on Sunday, just the good news is this. Enjoy the life God's given you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He wins. His work goes on and on, and again, he paints some pictures of the way his work works. But thankfully, he didn't leave it for us to mess it up. Now, again, we have a choice of how much we want to enter in and enjoy and, and share these good things, but the good things go on. The fruit of the harvest goes on forever. And our encouragement is enjoy the fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. The fruit is forever. The vineyard is forever. Enjoy the fruit and then pass the fruit. Share it with others. That's, that's life. And so here the picture that Jesus paints for us next, and it's kind of a, well, it is a definite two-part picture. It says in verse 9 that he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and he rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. And at the harvest time he sent a slave to the vine growers in order that they might give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. So he proceeded to send another slave and they beat him also. They treated him shamefully and they threw him out, sending him away empty-handed. And then he proceeded to send a third. I don't, I don't know that I'd really want to work for this guy, by the way. <laughs> you know, and now you get to go. Oh boy, what do you think's gonna happen? He sent a third, and this one also they wounded and threw out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. And so they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He'll come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, may it never be. But he looked at them and said, what then is that which is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. And everyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Now, as typical for me, I'm overly ambitious, and I come to the Bible and intended to look at this whole thing. Everything I've read, I thought, well, let's, let's talk about all of that, and, and right from the beginning, in my initial notes, I said, this may be too much. And now that I've written out everything I've looked at, I already know it's, it's too much have to split it into two because it really is two. It talks about the vineyard, the, the tender fruit. And then it has this second picture. And it's not that they don't belong together. That's why I read them together. And we'll look at the second part next week. But the tender fruit in the first part, the vineyard, and then the hard stone and the building. 
And in many ways, what could be different than that? And that, yet the two of them together. And what helped me decide pretty quickly that, you know what, I'm not going to race through it and try to put the two together. I'm just going to separate them out. What helped me with that is the fact that it's, I don't know if it's cherry season or just we have a whole lot in our refrigerator. But, but my wife has been buying cherries. And, then I, I, and I kind of think that it's my duty in life to eat up everything before it goes bad, whether it kills me or not. You know, I'm always just like, oh, gosh, got to eat this, got to eat that. And so I've been eating a lot of cherries this week. And then I, I noticed she bought another bag. And I'm like, oh, boy. And I'm always in a hurry, you know. Actually, burritos go best for me because I can drive and eat and go. Cherries are something that, you know, if you try to go fast, which I did, find out that that's, that's tough. You know, and I'd always try and find a faster way to do it. I'm working on one thing, and I got cherries, and I wash them off, and I pull all the stems out, and I pop about seven of them in my mouth at once, and, and pride myself on the fact that I have a trained tongue, and I know how to separate out one from the other, and I'm working on that. And I would have been good if that's all I did, but I started doing other things on top of that, and, and, and it wasn't long before I found myself biting down on a, on a hard stone there in the center. And thankfully, it was not... Well, my teeth were a little harder. I'm glad, to, I'm glad of that because I felt the crack and the crunch and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there goes my teeth. And it was just the stone. And then, you know, a little bit later, having not learned my lesson, my tongue was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then not learning my lesson again, I nearly choked because something else happened. And I, and I rejoiced that cherry seeds are just too small to die from, but it, I certainly... <laughs> Wheezed. So anyway, all of that came to my mind as I looked at this, the tender fruit and the hard stone, and I thought, you know what, let's just, let's just set aside the one and then put them back together again later. But just the idea that, that in these two pictures of the same thing, it's, it's not we who grow the fruit, it's not we who build the building. All of this belongs to God. Our choice is in the handling of the fruit. How do we handle the fruit? How do we handle the harvest? How do we handle what belongs to God. How do we handle that tender fruit? And, and what do we do with those stones? It's, this is a story about how the people who saw themselves as the builders, they looked at Jesus and said, he's not very useful for our building. He's, he's not what we want. We've got a plan in our mind of what the temple should look like, the building should look like, and he just doesn't fit. So set him aside. And again, that's, that's for next week. But just in both pictures, the idea is, look, a lot of pressure is off of us. God grows the vineyard. God builds the building. But here's our privilege and responsibility, handling the fruit and finding a way, finding his way to fit in the building and, and to, to, to be what God wants us to be. Because every part, every piece is precious. He's the builder. He's the architect. But again, uh, God is the God of life. Our choice is, do you want to enjoy life? Do you want to receive life? Do you want to... to Take that sweet fruit and then pass the fruit. Share the fruit. That's a big part of it. You know, it's, it's, it's realizing that God's got enough. You know, when we pray every day, all the time, Father, feed us, forgive us, deliver us. When we have that attitude, we also realize that our Father can feed us all, forgive us all, deliver us all. It's not, a, it's not dog eat dog. It's Father, feed us all, forgive us all, deliver us all. So part of enjoying the fruit is passing the fruit and sharing it with others. And that's the, that's the overall idea. So with that in mind, let's, let's go back and look a little bit more closely at the, at the first part when it talks about the vineyard. And when he does so, I'm going to read to you something, remind you of something that uh, the leaders, the people at that time didn't need this reminder. But since you and I might, the Lord had previously painted a picture of the vineyard. This wasn't a new uh, idea being brought forward. You know, for, for you folks, if I bring out old glory, in fact, if I say old glory, I bring out old glory, you're not imagining some old codger coming out here and there's old glory. You're, you're probably already imagining, especially in the light of, of uh, 4th of July, old glory, red, white, and blue, the flag. You know, I don't have to explain that to you. You, you know, because this is your culture. This is your time. Well, in that culture, in that time, when you talk about the vineyard, when you talk about the vine, it was one of those pictures that, that meant Israel and the nation of Israel and our national identity. And, and uh, uh, you know, this is, of course, right within hours of that time when Jesus came into Jerusalem and everyone was waving the, the palm branches, which is, again, was a picture of their, their patriotic flag waving, if you will, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, save now, son of David. And Jesus wept. He's saying, 
if you knew the things that make for peace. They're thinking, we know what makes for peace. Deal with the Romans, deal with the taxes, deal with our troubles, make Israel great again. Do that and we'll be good. And Jesus weeps. No, that's not, that's not what it's about. And so it's, it's all in that setting that he talks about this vineyard. And I'll just read to you what the prophet Isaiah had said. It was actually a song. I don't know if it's the top 20 or, you know, how, but you put something to music and you, you make a poem out of it, it's even more memorable. And, and I'll just read it real quickly from Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, and he dug it all around it, removed the stones, planted it with the choicest of vine. He built a tower in the middle of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and then he looked for it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? Why then, when I looked for it to produce good grapes, why did it produce worthless ones? And, and so it goes on from there, but when Isaiah first said that to the people who were the leaders at the time, if, when they heard that, you know how much they liked that? Oh, say that again, Isaiah. They liked it so much, they cut him in half. <laughs> like so many of the prophets, like this picture that Jesus is saying, when somebody comes as a protester, and by the way, they're not prophets until they're dead. Then, then they're prophets. No, they're just protesting. And when they come with a protest against what's going on right now, if it doesn't line up with what you want to do right now, which everything that Isaiah was saying did not line up with the powers that be in Israel at the time, he was rejected. Now when Jesus comes along, oh, they've already got monuments built to Isaiah. Isaiah was a great one. You know, we would never have done what our fathers did to him. He spoke the truth, but they all knew this picture. They all knew this, this idea of Israel being like a vineyard. And now they find that in the story that Jesus is telling them, they too, the, the ones who are put in charge. Here in the picture, he talks about those who are put in charge. They're the ones who, who are basically supposed to be involved in doing the work. And then you give a, a, a certain portion, you give a certain share to the owner because he's, he's the owner of the land. It belongs to him. It's only fair. So those who were uh, put in charge, you know, who, basically anyone who saw themselves as being in charge. Certainly the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw themselves as that. The Herodians saw themselves as that. They fought with one another just like political parties today. He's saying, well, you're not in charge here. I'm in charge. But the fact is, is that each of them who saw themselves as being in charge, they were part of this whole picture. Part of this picture of when, when the Lord sends his prophets simply saying, be fair, share. When, when those messengers came, the messengers were wounded. And so it talks about those, Jesus referred to them as those who've climbed up into the seat of Moses. They're not Moses, but they climbed up in his chair, and therefore they speak from on high. And so Jesus said at that time, listen to them. You know, give taxes to, to, to Caesar, what belongs to Caesar, your religious you know, ritual stuff. Do, they're, they're in the seat of Moses. Jesus said, do, do as they say, but don't do as they do. They're hypocrites. They're phony, and that's the warning always for us. The people put in charge, basically, they served selfishly. They didn't just enjoy the fruit. When it came to the owner saying, hey, you know what, I want my share of it, they wouldn't even share with the owner. No, <laughs> we don't have enough. We don't have enough. Never know. Might be a bad season next year. Got to have a little bit more. Got to have more in storage. And they, they served selfishly. And anyone who came and said, hey, that's wrong, they threw them out. Anyone who, who protested, they, they said, how dare you say we're selfish? How dare you say we're wrong? And so they would silence those who spoke up. Later we call them prophets. But silence those who speak up, who say, you know what? What you're doing is abusive. What you're doing is wrong. Okay, so... So far, as far as this parable goes, no, no mystery. And some of you are already wondering if I'm going to jump into politics here in just a minute. And you know what? If you are, I'm glad you are, because I'm not. 
but at least you're thinking, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to us? How does this apply today? to today? Because these truths are for all, for all time, because human nature is the same, and the human Savior is the same. So looking at the parable so far, it's, it's no real mystery. You have, you have an owner who is wanting just his own fair share of the produce, and every time he sends someone to get his fair share, people say, no, we're not going to do it. And then when they protest, how dare you be that way? They get thrown out, they get abused, they get harmed. All, all of that so far is, is no great mystery. That's human nature. It could be a story from many cultures, many different times, okay? Now, here's where the mystery really begins, is verse 13, where Jesus, having talked about that story, he said, and then the owner of the vineyard said, what am I going to do? I'm going to send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. That's a head scratcher. That is a profound mystery. You send three, like I said earlier, I wouldn't want to work for this owner because you, you, know, you know what's going to happen. First time, second time, third time, you know what's going to happen. And then he says, I know, I'll send my son. Perhaps they'll respect him. And my thought is, how could anybody be so naive? How could anybody expect something like they're going to respect your son after they've done that? How could you, anyone be, how could this be a picture of? As I believe it's intended to be a picture of God. How could this be a picture of God in his infinite wisdom? I mean, is the, is the owner patient? I'm going to send my son? Yes, patient. Maybe patient to a fault. Like, gosh, these people need to get the ax somewhere along the line. Certainly patient. Gentle, and again, yeah, maybe gentle to a fault. Come on, don't allow this to keep going on. Is the owner merciful? Yes, he's merciful. Maybe too merciful, all of that. But like I said earlier, is he wise? Is this the wise God? And based upon the way I think and most of you think, I, would, I got the answer. No, it's naive, it's simplistic, it's foolish. Is this wise no way. But because it's a mystery, one that's still being played out through the ages, the answer isn't no way. The answer is no. Wait. See how smart God is. See how wise he is. Because the fact of the matter is, you know the end of the story. One day, crowds that can't be counted, Every tribe, nation, people, tongue will surround a throne, the throne of the universe. And seated there won't be a, a conquering hero as we see heroes, not a great lion, but, but a lamb. And a wounded lamb at that, a, a lamb as though slain. So, yes, God is, is infinitely wise. And I certainly can't figure him out. And, man, there's a bunch of mysteries in my everyday life. But the fact is, good news, he's wise. And so he, he sends his beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But they didn't. Not then. Not at the time. Still not all that much. But hang in there. It'll get better. But at the time, he sends his son. It says in verse 14, when the vine growers saw him, they talked with each other. They reasoned with, with one another. They said, this is the heir. This is the, the son of the owner. Let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. And again, if you were reading this story for the first time, or if you were watching it on a DVD or something, you, you'd, again, probably be thinking, who, who wrote this screenplay? Who, who couldn't see this coming? You think you're going to send your son and they're going to respect him? No, in fact, they did worse to him than they did to all the other servants before. The rest were abused. He was killed. Didn't you see that coming? How smart are you, oh, owner? And then the craziness of the people who kill him. How crazy is that? Thinking, I know we will kill the son and then somehow we're going to inherit the whole place. That's how crazy we can get. That's how crazy it was what happened to Jesus. That's how crazy we can be when we're blinded by our own selfishness. So much desiring to keep what I got. And don't you dare tell me anything otherwise. And, and when that starts to get worked up within me, Heaven help the person that comes and tells you differently. Because that's the mindset of, of human nature. 
and crazy. No, you can't win. You can't win by abuse. You can't win by force. Ultimately, the meek will inherit the earth. They will. But again, just the craziness. If he, if he came again, we would crucify him again. We're not any better. That's just who we are. The wonderful thing is he loves us knowing who we are. And, and he can make us better. We can become better by, first of all, recognizing that in myself, I'm, I'm not any better. I, I have the same tendency. So the craziness where they think that they can kill him and somehow keep it all for themselves. So it says, verse 15, they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then the question, what therefore will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Well, what do you think? He'll come and he'll destroy those vine growers and he'll give the vineyard to others. That's what he's going to do. Now, Luke here and, and Mark does the same. They put those words, the answer to the question. The question, what's the, what's the owner going to do? The answer, he's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end and he'll give the vine vineyard over to others who will bring forth the fruit thereof. That, those words are, are in red. They're coming from the mouth of Jesus. But Matthew's gospel, the, the words I just quoted, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew himself being a Jew and an eyewitness to these things, in this case, gives a, a, a fuller version of it. And actually, you go back and read Matthew, and you find that when Jesus asked the question, what, what's going to be done to these people? What will the, what will the owner do? They said, why, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he'll give the vineyard over to others that, that the produce might be yielded up and shared in the way it's supposed to be yielded. And, and I, I believe that's exactly the way it was. Mark and Luke just simply have Jesus saying, essentially, amen. You, you just passed a judgment, and you know what? Your judgment is just. That's what justice would do. And, and the incredible thing... The, the important thing in Matthew's gospel by, by it being in the mouths of those who themselves were going to be calling for Christ's crucifixion, who were already plotting to get one more protester out of the way, that, that while that was happening, as crazy as that is, you're going to crucify the Lord of glory? You're going to crucify the Son of God? As crazy as that was, and as much as Jesus later said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The very fact that he could put the story to them and they could jump in and say, this is justice, simply proves the fact that no matter how crazy they are, they're not crazy. They, they, you can't claim criminal insanity. You still know how to be just when it involves judging someone else. You still know what justice is. You just don't see it for yourself. You don't apply it for yourself. And so these leaders at that time, just like David back in the Old Testament story when, when his friend Nathan comes up and tells David this terrible story, and David gets caught so much up in the story that he wants to just go throttle that guy. And, and then Nathan says, David, that's, that's a picture of you. You're the man. In the same way these leaders got so caught up in this story, they said, this is what's got to happen. And Jesus said, yeah. That's justice. That's, that's what should happen. But, you know, the, the story's still being played out. We act crazy. We're just not crazy. I mean, we're crazy in a crazy way. And Father, forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. But we're pretty good at judging when we're looking out at someone else. And that's the one place where we should be much slower, much more perilous than cherries in the mouth and separating out the, the good from the, from the not so good. When we're trying to judge others, be, oh, slow down, be careful. And seeing myself, that's always the place where I stand before God. God, you, you show me. Because no one can preach it at you. Even if they were right, if they preached it at you, you would quit. Especially nowadays, you don't have to kill them. Just go to a different church. Just tune into a different station. Just find a different friend. You know, just unfriend them. And it's easy nowadays. If I don't like what you're saying, I'm done with you. And that's, I think that's okay, really, in a sense. Because you know what? No one can force you to the truth anyway. And God never tried to force it. It dawns on us. If it comes at all, it comes... Subtly, it comes when we're maybe willing, finally, 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Show me. Is it me, Lord? Am I? Is this picture a picture of me in some way? And, and before that mirror, yeah, God will show you. God will tell you where it is where we might be doing things that are a little bit crazy. And they got the picture. As soon as he said, hey, the, look, the business is being given to someone else. The whole vineyard is going to someone else who's going to do it right. They knew exactly what he meant, and that's why they said, may it never be. Like, oh, we, ju we just lost the franchise. The nation Israel isn't going to be just the chosen nation exclusively like we thought it was supposed to be. Somehow the vineyard is being given over to others. They said, may it never be. But you know what? It must ever be. That's the way it has to be because that's justice and justice will prevail. Justice wins. Don't fret about, oh, they're getting away with it. No, no one gets away with anything. Justice will prevail. It has to prevail. Question is, do I want justice? To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. It's, it's pretty simple. Is that, is that what I want? If you start with walking humbly with God, he'll show you what's just, what's fair. And he'll teach you about mercy. And justice will prevail, but never at the expense of mercy. Mercy is never harmed in the, in the giving out of justice. And so God, working through people, will, will always do what's fair and just, but also what is merciful and kind, and, and these are not in opposition. And I would say, reading this and, and thinking about it and applying it to myself, if, if I were in any way in my life right now, let me talk about me for a second, my favorite subject, it'll take the pressure off of you, let me just say, Lord, is it me? Am I abusing someone in my life right now? Am I the blind abuser, the selfish blind abuser of my wife or my neighbor or somebody else where I'm just not being fair with them, I'm not being merciful toward them because it's all about me, that's the way I see it? Is there some place in my life right now, Lord, where I'm just being selfishly stubborn and if anyone told me differently, I would unfriend that person. <laughs> Don't you dare tell me anything differently. And you know, as I think about that, you know, at the, at the moment, being of, of sound mind, I hope, <laughs> I got the Bible in front of me, I've been praying, I, it's an easy place. Church is an easy place to think. And I, and I think right now, I would say, God, if I am, stop me. Please, Lord, stop me. If I'm taking advantage, if I'm abusing someone, if I'm being unfair with someone, and I just won't hear it from anyone else, Lord, can I hear it from you? Show me. And I, and I hope that most all of you would have that same kind of desire. Lord, you show me. I don't want to do that to people. I really don't. I may be doing it right now, but I really don't want to live that way. I don't. I remember as a kid, I, I, I grew up on monster movies. Loved all the monster movies. Even bought little, you know, other kids bought little model, glue together model kits of cars and jets. I, I got models of monsters. And I had them all, the mummy and the creature and Frankenstein. And, but my favorite was, was always the Wolfman. I always liked Lon Chaney Jr. and the Wolfman. I, I think it was because I, I thought I could do a good Wolfman imitation. And it gave me a sense of power, being the little, the little brother, you know, it's like, oh, watch out. But I remember I, in one of those Wolfman type films, the, the guy, uh, I can't, can't remember who he is, what, he, what he was, his Bruce Wayne counter person. But uh, whatever he was, when he wasn't the wolf man, I remember that guy saying to people, you know, tonight, if you hear funny things come out of my bedroom, do not unlock the, you know, if you keep the key on your side, don't let me out, no matter how much I plead, no matter how much I growl and cry. Uh, I can't tell you why, but just please don't let me out. Because, man, I, sometimes... I can be so hurtful toward others. And so I've, I've often thought about that whole idea, and, and really I would say, and that's why I'm saying it right now, is that if, if I'm hurting somebody, and I think, I'm not hurting you, grow up, quit whining, you snowflake, quit, you know. If, if I am being unfair in any way in my life, God, help me see that. That's, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be that way. 
And granted, sometimes people will say you're unfair and you ought to do this, and actually you are being fair and you are being just and you are doing what's right. So I'm not saying it's all one side or the other. I'm just saying that only God can show us things that we have deeply entrenched in our own way of being selfish. And I don't want what I think is just and right ever to be the expense, at the expense of somebody else in terms of fairness and kindness. And so I would say for me, and I, I, I hope we all as people would say for us, Lord, stop us. Is there some way we're doing that? It's, it's, it's crazy how crazy we can be. And when Jesus in Matthew 23 went down and talked about what hypocrisy does to you. He gave a, a series of eight woes. In, in Luke, we only got the last two at the very last of the chapter. We'll get there in a while. But, but he gave all of these woes and the, the woest woe of them all, the last of the, of the eight, I'll just read to you. Jesus said, woe to you religious leaders, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and you adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Consequently, because you're that way, you bear witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. So it's by the very fact that you're so blind proves that you're just like them, because they were that blind. It's just something about who we are. You build these monuments to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and you somehow think that they're the heaters. They had their own faults and failings. And, and yeah, they were martyred, but the fact is, is they're just witness of what's inside of man. It's something inside of our own corrupted DNA. It's just something inside of our humanity. I mean, it's fine for amoebas and, and little squirmy things coming out of the muck, you know, to survival of the fittest. That's fine for for insects and stuff. But, but as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, it's got to be more than just that. But the fact is, is that all of the folks that we look up to as heroes, some much better, some much higher than others, but we all have our failings. And that's why hero worship is always a, a bad idea. Even if you find better heroes, even if your heroes are a little bit better than somebody else's heroes, whenever you keep propping them up, you, you forget the fact that all of our idols have feet of clay. All of the monuments that we've built to someone, there's someone they stepped on somewhere along the line. And all those people who've been trodden down and walked over, don't make heroes of them either because a generation or two before or after they were treading on and walking on someone else. It's humanity. And it's not like, oh yeah, people are disgusting. That's why I'm heading for the hills. That's where all the really disgusting people are. I say that for Howard and Jane because they've run for the hills. Now the fact is, is no matter where you go, even if you're all alone, you're still with a corrupted human being with yourself. It's not like, oh, I hate it. No, love. He, he, God is not ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed to call us family. So I'm not saying be ashamed. Just understand that there are sometimes behaviors that we should be ashamed of. So change the behavior. Ask God to show you where the sickness is because it's a common sickness that afflicts us all. And in every generation, we, we tend to have our similar selfish blindness. And it's, it's seen so clearly later, and you build a monument to someone later, you can't see it when it's right in front of your face. And knowing that that's the case, just bear that in mind. And in, in honor of... Fourth of July and the fact that I failed to sing I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy here this morning, I'll just remind you of, of our nation. And it's not because I'm ashamed of this nation any more than I'm ashamed of my own parents and my family. I love my family. But you know what? It's good that other people from other nations love their nation and love their family as well. And the fact is, though, as, as much as there are so many amazing good things, there ought to be amazing good things coming from this country because we had such a wonderful opportunity like no one else had to begin it all over again. And some of the people really thought, we're going to begin it all over again. They had this utopian ideal wherever they settled. But you find out after a while, you know what? We're doing it again. And now, a century or so later, we can look at things and say, how could they do that? I mean, it's easy to look at slavery, to, to, to look at people writing, you know, all men created equal and then owning slaves, it's, it's, 
it's easy from our perspective to say, oh, what a hypocrite. I'm not even going to go to his monument. I'm not. But you know what? That's, it's just easy to see that they were blind now. It's easy to see now what was done to a lot of the indigenous people in this country. It's a shame, a lot of the things that were done. Because people were just greedy. This land is your land. This land is my land. Oh. And, and, and is, a, is there a simple solution? No. Was it going to be complicated and difficult? You bet. Could I have fixed it? Probably not. But the encouragement always is, if you can see it in someone else at a distance, just be aware that there might be ways in which we're just walking on someone. We're, ta we're not being fair. We're taking advantage of it. And, and again, uh, don't worry about politics. I mean, uh, vote where you can. If you're, a, if you're a government official, certainly you got more of responsibility, wh whatever. It's hard jobs to do. And there's a lot of necessary evils in this world. But just, just how about your family? How about your parents? How about your spouse? Where am I being neglectful and abusive of someone because I'm just walking in my selfishness? And it's, and it's easy to see, you know, later, a little closer in time, the, the Japanese internment camps. And now monuments built and, oh, ne never again, shouldn't have happened. But, you know, that generation has just about died off, but it wasn't that long ago. And I, I'm old enough to know a lot of folks that lived through that. And there's like, hey, we were in California. It wasn't that simple. Uh, it wasn't hatred. It was, but it's like, well, you shouldn't have done that. Okay, that's, that's history. That's just a reminder that, you know what, we build the monuments and we feel good about ourselves, but God's not in the business of just having us feel good. It's, let's do good. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. How? I, I, that's not my job to tell you how. I'm just here to say that's, just slow down. Just like eating cherries, slow down. Be careful. There are sweet, good things to eat. There are other things that will break your teeth on. So be careful. And, and, and don't just enjoy the fruit, but, but share the fruit. You find something good, share it with someone else. Freely you've received. Freely give, Jesus said. And for my life, I don't, I don't want to just enjoy what I want if it's at the expense of someone else because at some point I'm going to wake up to the fact that, you know what, I can't enjoy it anymore. If it's at the expense of my brother, it's at the expense of me because we belong together. If I'm damaging someone in the family, I'm damaging me because I belong to that family. We all belong to the Father. So as far as the vineyard goes, as far as the government goes, as far as... My hope is always that wiser heads would handle it. Because it seems like the leaders have always had these selfish ways. It's that way any place. It's not one company. It's not... Wells Fargo, and they're the bad ones. All those other good banks, and now Wells. It's so funny to hear the Wells Fargo commercials where they're trying to do the dance and reinvent themselves. And you know what? I, one of my kids works for Wells Fargo, another one works for Citigroup. They're both evil, I can tell you that. No, they're, they're people. And in those positions, you try, you, if you're wise, you try and be fair. You, you can't just say, hey, print the money, give it all out. You, you, you got to be practical. But I don't think any one of us can really enjoy the good fruit that God's given us unless we have an attitude that says, not only am I going to freely enjoy it, I'm going to freely learn to help others to enjoy it. Because the fruit of the earth belongs to all the people of the earth. It's not just who got there and exploited it first. It's that this is something that comes, that God's freely placed within the, the, the world itself. And so finding ways to, to work it out. And my hope is always you know, that wiser heads would handle it, and that's not the next election. It, it, the wiser heads won't be governmental or religious heads. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be Christ. If and where, not if, there is a true church. But it's not in any one building or denomination. And, and wherever the church is being the church, it's just the body of Christ. He's the head. The wiser head rules. And, and those are just people who are doing what he would have us to do. And that's always my idea. God, help me to be what you would want me to be. I don't, I don't want to be simplistic in my solutions. You hear it all the time. If you don't hear it, you read it, blog it. Simplistic solutions. It's not a solution. You don't just do this because it... I don't want to be sol simplistic in my solutions. But, but I, I want to be simple in my soul. I, I want to have, like Jesus said, if, you, if, if your soul is simple, if it's not divided, if it's not 
convoluted. If your soul is simple, then all things are pure. You'll see things clearly. God help me to have that. I, I don't want to be idealistic. A lot of times people, oh, we just got to do this. Just share the planet. Share everything. Just, you know, again, open the floodgates. It, it, it can't work that way. Not yet. We're not grown up enough for that. Not yet. We still have to have armies and police force. We're not grown up enough. We haven't learned to love our neighbor. We haven't matured enough yet. But while I don't want to be idealistic, I don't, I don't want to lose my ideal. My ideal is Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And I find all the time, you know what? I can't do what Jesus would do. I wish I could, though. Lord, help me to be more like you. But it's just, it's just that. And when it talks about the vineyard, I'm going to take it away from the Pharisees and Sadducees or whoever they were and give it over to others. Who did he give it to? And some will say, I've said it a minute, million times, he gave it over to the church. And then you've got to ask the question, which church? And then each church will give you the answer. Ours! We're the real one. We're the true one. We're the oldest one. We're the most stuck in our ways one. We haven't changed in a thousand years. What, whatever. It, suddenly we're fighting once again. Which part? Which part of which church? Which party? Which group? Who's really doing it right? Where, where do you go and bless them with your fellowship because they're doing it right? And now I'm here to join you in rightness. The fact is we're all flawed. And, and God help each of us to hear from him. But here's the encouraging thing for me when I think of who did he, he took it away from Israel. Who did he give it over to? He kept it in his own hands. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He, the way the fruit is grown is by individually. He says, if you abide in me, if you just hang in there with me, you'll bear the fruit. If you're bearing the fruit, you're not so afraid, you're not so selfish, you're not so stingy, you're not so worried because you got love and joy and peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Again, the fruit, it's, it makes life a whole lot easier. Enjoy the fruit. Hang in there with Jesus. Don't lose hold of that ideal. And then understand this, that the vineyard is forever. This is not like, oh my gosh, we've got to go harvest the fruit. We've got to freeze dry it, pack it away. We've got to get into survivalist mode. <laughs> the vineyard is forever. Just like next week, the temple. The building stands forever. The, the vineyard is forever, but it's not their vineyard. It's not our vineyard. It's not yours. It's not mine. It belongs to the Father. And the more we think along those lines, our Father, feed us, forgive us, deliver us, the more we see him as our Father. There's no one that we can say, don't, don't you sing that Yes, Jesus Loves Me song that we sang, or don't, you can't. Don't you. The minute we start to say you don't belong, now there's something inside of us that doesn't belong. And that's the interesting thing. It talks about these people in charge throwing people out, even though they're sent directly from the owner. Even the son, kill them, throw them out. Belongs to us. In the end, who gets thrown out? The only ones that get thrown out are the ones who are throwing other people out. And even there, I don't think it's the people so much as it's the attitude. And I would say amen to that. God, if I in any way have an attitude that, that wants to just clean house and, and throw others out. Lord, throw that out. And if I won't let go of it, then throw me out for as long as it takes until I'm going to be a happy boy and come back and say, you know what? I want to play by your rules. Everybody belongs. I've got no right to throw anyone out. I've got no right to see myself as superior to, to anybody. Their judgment was bring those wretches to a wretched end and give it over to someone else who will yield the fruit. It's a good judgment. But even then, you probably had the wrong picture in your mind. And wouldn't you all agree that all wretches and all wretchedness need to be thrown out? And where does it start? It doesn't have a part in heaven. Lord, in my heart, if in any way I'm, I'm the wretch that wants to, you know, see someone else as inferior to me. If there's any wretchedness in me, I, who wants wretchedness? And so that's, that's, that's the joy. That's the hope. I have put you all into a place of peace. It's true. I, I think you heard it. It's more profound and more mysterious, and so I won't go on for 10 more minutes trying to explain what can't be explained. Just understand this. God is good. God wins. D. 
Do you want to join him? It's a pretty happy place. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Enjoy the fruit, pass the fruit freely. Let's close with a couple of songs. Thank you.